Orlando, it's your turn. We are at the famous Lottie Underground Recording Studio. You're listening to a series of <laughs> very great Now remember, I mean, the ultimate judge of the adequacy of design is the using of it. So if they lack how this sounds, that's all that counts. Take it, Adi. Good evening, <laughs> and welcome to the next installment of Design Forum's Institute for Future Studies. You may wonder why no one is standing up in front of you yeah. What? Good question. Next, tonight, we are honored to be assaulted by the verbal presage of Jay Baldwin. Jay was born on a clear day. The day after it was clear, and to this day it is clear, that Jay has confused everyone that has ever met him. Huh? What? He is one of the people alive who will give you a straight answer even when you don't want it. When I first met Jay, he was working for Bill Moss, famous tent maker on a project to create a house out of cardboard. What about shingles or plywood or two by four? To continue, there was a sign tacked <laughs> on a death-wrenching double-needle sewing machine which cautioned that this particular machine had the tendency to it sew skin and bones. Author J. Baldwin. From that time on, I knew that he was a technical editor. <laughs> Since been the technical editor of the Whole Earth Catalog, <laughs> Coevolution, editor of the book Soft Tech, and co author of Dome Books 1 and 2. Immediately following the sewing machine proficiency course, which, which I found myself, oh, that doesn't make sense, Roger. Okay, never mind. We'll edit this part out. Immediately following the sewing machine proficiency course, I found myself staggering, only to fall back on an old piano, which when plucked had a rather tinny sound. You, you guessed it, Jay put thumbtacks. Doesn't he know about pushpins? Into the hammers and tried to duplicate Scott Joplin's maple leaf rag ten years before the, the sting. sting. Since then, he has mastered the cross cut and ripsaws respectfully. The very next day, I find two racing shells out by the dock, one of which was broken in two pieces. Just a minute, just a minute now. Doesn't that actually make three racing shells out by the dock? <laughs> to make sense out of the fact that Moss and Jay went over a dam, Jay later co-founded Motherload, one of the first and biggest river outfitters Good luck. luck. I believe that Jay's undoing the reason he can't function in this society and has been given a one-way ticket into the Institute for Future Studies is that he spent his formative years, 31 out of 50 years, with that four-syllabled verb, Buckminster Fuller. Yay, Bucky. I can just imagine how many shells or domes he sank. Somewhere in between soup and salad, took a long, hot ride out of the steaming rainforest of Illinois to do a nom de plume house at Integrated Living Systems in New Mexico. And it took him three years to get out of that mess. Autonomous houses. Imagine that. If a chronicle of a man's undoing can be traced through his indiscretions, I can show why we should have mercy on this individual. Throwing caution to the wind and letting the skeletons out. 22 years of teaching. San Francisco State. Sacramento State. San Francisco Art Institute. California College of Arts and Crafts. UC Davis. Southern Illinois University. Barlona Institute. And the infamous alternative high school. Pacific High! As you can see, he cannot hold a job. Who could? <laughs> Even in three years time at the New Alchemy Institute, competing with class, working on bio-shelter systems. Let whoever fits this description come forward and let us know how this talk on equal architecture and earth stewardship 
will protect our Here he is. This work? Well, uh, in a previous incarnation, uh, I built dragsters. Yeah, you did. I'm going to tonight uh, do something that isn't very becoming, but since many of you are becoming, uh, I want to show you how at least one person and a lot of friends, me rarely the leader, uh, have been working for a long time now uh, trying to do things a little better than we think they had been done in the past. And um, I've got nothing really to brag on and I'm not any different than any of you. A uh, very similar background to many of you probably. Uh, a little different aim than some and a little more willingness for punishment, maybe. But uh, it's, it's not a bragging thing. I take a delight in the stuff that I'll be showing you. It's joyful to me. I like going to work. Um, just before Bucky Fuller died last July, uh, we were driving into Boston with him having had a very good day. And he said, well, old man, what are you going to do when you retire? <laughs> And we laughed literally for 15 miles down the freeway about the absurdity of retirement. Okay, I want to uh, want to show two paths here. I was raised up a mechanic by a father who was an engineer, and by a mother who kept her place like they were trained to do in those days. And. Um, I got an education in biology that I taught myself. And over the years, as the mechanicing became incomplete, it seemed very incomplete to me, I began meeting people whose biology seemed very incomplete to them. And we got together. I want to show you how this happened. And uh, there's more than a little luck involved. There's a lot of work involved. The results are dramatic, but like all results, um, they're more dramatic than the endless drudgery that went into it. As all of you know who've ever done anything, you know it's mostly uh, drudgery. But when you know you've got something coming up from it, then it makes it easier to do. So I'm going to start uh, with some ideas about what quality is, intuition, a few things like that. You know, you, you uh, hear that the finest car in the world, you all know, is Rolls Royce. You know what's on the nose of a Rolls Royce? The grill there? That's a chrome plated model of the Parthenon. Here comes the Parthenon. This is the best we can do, apparently. How did this come to be that pushing a Greek church down the road was the best thing to do? I mean, Rolls Royce makes jet engines. So the plane I came this morning, maybe Boeing should have put a Parthenon on the nose of that. You see how silly that would be if you had this. Greek pediment on the nose of a 727. On a car, it seems to be access acceptable. It isn't acceptable, and the kind of thinking that went into that is not acceptable. It has hurt a lot of people. People get more interested in the Parthenon on the nose than whether there's any brakes in the thing. I got thinking about that as a kid. I got thinking about a lot of things that worried me that people seemed to think was really great that turn, when you really thought about it was not so hot. I didn't know anything about the biology that was going on around me. I just assumed that smog was something you couldn't do much about and that the, you know, remember in grade school, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica films present uh, the story of farm farming in America, the story of men and machines uh, stomping nature into oblivion or to make the food for millions, that kind of thing. I didn't know better. I was raised up to think that was a good thing to do. The technology was going to solve everything. And it turned out that's not true. A lot of you know that. Some of you just intuitively. I made a smart remark this evening at dinner 
that Los Angeles is something that nature doesn't permit for very long. This is true. You wait and see. It'll be in your lifetime. We'll find out. We can't make it run much longer. Not this way. That doesn't mean we have to blow it away, mind you. There's some alternatives in this. I was uh, interested as I started working with mechanics at trying to make things lighter. I thought it was silly, even back in hot rod days, that it took 6,000 pounds to carry a housewife to the market uh, to do the shopping. I was building dragsters, finally built one that weighed 168 pounds with me in it. And it did all right. It turned out to be illegal. It didn't have a clutch. It uh, had a lever that raised the back wheels off the ground. When you let go of the lever, it dropped it on the street, and away you went. <laughs> but uh, it was light, and it went. Uh, it had a dry ice cooled Harley Davidson engine in it. And I met Bucky Fuller when I was 18. He really upset me. He started a lecture very similar to this one at uh, about 7 in the evening, and he concluded at 10.30 the following morning. I'll try to do better, but uh, um, I found that when listening to him, either, either he was dead wrong or I was dead wrong, but it wasn't both of us. The, the, the sort of thing that he was pushing was inherently right, even though if he, he didn't know how to make it work at the time, how to connect it to a practical world. He soon learned how to do that. And I worked on things uh, that had to do with that with him as a student. And it, uh, it interested me a lot to see what kind of hostility came from the conventional architects. At the time, if you didn't do a Mies van der Rohe glass cube, you flunked. You had to do them. And uh, we read all our famous architects. That didn't show me much either. Bucky referred to conventional building as the craft and graft industry. He referred to things like safety factor as the factor of ignorance. He built things three times stronger than it had to be, or five times stronger than it had to be, and hope you were right. He thought he could do better than that. He used terms like more with less. That's a nice catchphrase. It sounds sort of eco-chic, kind of. But in private, he used a term that I like a lot better, ephemeralization that you should ephemeralize physical stuff, heading toward metaphysics, where you do everything with nothing. That isn't practical right now, but uh, we really can do a lot better than we do. Architects of a building like this, for instance, when it was built, didn't even care what it weighed, even though that energetically was something they should have known, because the, the stuff had to be mined, it had to be fabricated, it had to be transported. It does make a difference. But most people don't care about that. They say it's not practical to think in those terms. I thought so too at the time, but I thought that Bucky had to be right about that, but we didn't know what to do about it. And um, I think what I'm going to do now uh, is I think I am going to start showing the slides and talk as I go because I'm not in a very good humor to uh, just blab about it without it. But I don't want it turned out yet. I want to show you um, some of the stuff I, I'm going to show you is geodesic, dome stuff. I don't think domes are the living end for everything. But they have their uses, and I'll show you how we got into that. What I'd like to do first, though, is to, at the risk of boring some of you, give you a quick lesson in why they're strong and the sense behind it. Are we alive? Yeah. This is a cube. You'll notice in the cube is the diagonal bracing necessary to prevent. Don't do that. <laughs> necessary to prevent the cube from being a floppahedron. And you'll notice that the diagonal bracing in the cube actually is a tetrahedron. The tetrahedron is, of course, when I stand it up this way, you can see the base and the point. 
And I'll take the tetrahedron out of there because we're going to need it later. See, I just made it too. Getting floppier by the minute. So I dropped these sticks in that table, I'll never see them again. Okay, a cube inherently is kind of bendy. Nature doesn't use cubes for anything except in solid crystallography. Cubes also have a nasty tendency that you, you know about bracing cubes against floppiness, but they also do something else. They have torque. They can twist like that. So inherently, they're not very strong. If you take that tetrahedron, I love how they sit there like that. You take the tetrahedron, I'll make a nice stiff one for you here now. The tetrahedron is uh, the minimum surface, mi excuse me, maximum surface and minimum interior of any geometric solid. So, you can see that when we talk about tradition, tradition and tent design is pretty close to being tetrahedral. That means you're making a tent as heavy as possible, you're using the most canvas possible, you're having the maximum wind resistance, but you're being very traditional. And you'll notice that the smart tents these days are no longer tent shaped. Nonetheless, the tetrahedron is the uh, minimal within this there, you can't make out of sticks, you can't make a figure with less sticks that has an inside and an outside. In fact, with the same number of sticks, if I just put them together as triangles, I'd end up with two triangles. But if I put them together this way, see, I got six sticks, so I got to make two triangles. But this way, I get four triangles, which is what Bucky means when he talks of the word synergy, which is you get more than you thought you were going to get if you are clever, one way of putting that. The sum is greater than the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So by being clever with the same number of sticks, I got four triangles and I have a within this. It is also the, you can, uh, there's ev a lot of evidence now that this is the basic building block of universe just as Bucky had claimed for so long, that atomic structure indeed is put together of tetrahedra. And if you stack tetrahedra, you get a DNA double helix. And if you put 20 of them together, You get an icosahedron, which is just 20 of these guys put together, all regular sides, okay? But you can take out the insides. You can take out the inside ones for those of you that have had your structure courses know that a column is stiffer than a solid rod of the same diameter. This is because if the, the solid rod part of the load is being taken on the center of it, which has no, uh, no stiffness because it's infinitely tiny down the middle. And the, the stuff that is closer to the, the material is closer to the middle of the column, has less leverage, it's more floppy. And if you, have a, if you make a hollow tube the same diameter, all, of, all the stress has to be out in the shell where it's furthest from the center is stronger there. For the same reason, I can take out all these sticks in the middle make the load be taken on the skin. So actually this is 20 tetrahedra, okay? So I've gone from the thing now, the figure that has the most skin area and the least interior space, I'm heading very rapidly towards being a sphere, which is the least skin area and the most interior space, which is made out of the, the basic structure, basic universal structure, is really very strong. As a matter of fact, this tetrahedron, or this icosahedron, excuse me. Uh, if it was, if it had a pin through each one of these little things so that it, the, the sticks wouldn't pull out for me to put it in my pack to take it home, I could actually stand on this. Now you find that hard to believe. I ought to make one with pins in it and, and show you that, but I can actually stand on it. It won't, won't collapse. Okay, then how this becomes a dome is, let's just say I take off this top pentagon 
that I have I painted blue so you can see it. And I'm going to expand it by adding in the center of each one of these triangles another triangle and bulging it outward a little bit. Thoughts? This is, this is the same pentagon. It's even the same size. If I put it over here, put the stars together in the middle, it's, it is it. And I've got my dome. That's the basic idea of how domes work. And if you want them, if you want to make them bigger, you've got a slenderness ratio. You know about slenderness ratios. Normally, the, you're told that slenderness ratios can only be so much or they get too floppy to, to be useful. You don't put a big weight on the top of a flagpole and it doesn't work very well. I've made domes where the slenderness ratio was 80 to 1 and is plenty strong. I'll show you some that withstand a hurricane at 135 miles an hour with its slenderness ratio and the structure of 80 to 1. That's because most of these struts are in tension. And the word geodesic means the most economical path between energy events. These hubs are energy events. You can, there's all kind of uh, analogies to the, this kind of thing in physics. And uh, it actually happens that if you strike a dome on one side, the, strut on, the matching strut on the other side will deform. This is the reason they have, the domes have a bad reputation about leaking, is because when the sun shines on one side, it expands the material on that side because it gets as hot. And the, that side of the dome gets bigger. The other side gets bigger too, only its materials are cold and they haven't gotten bigger themselves, so the joints have to open and that makes the leaks. And when domes are made of plywood and so forth, they inevitably leak. And the dome kits you buy with shingles on them and so forth. It's like backing a turkey into a hurricane when the wind hits those <laughs> shingles. It doesn't work very well. Anyway, um, by the way, I am not, not uh, a complete ratchet jaw. You can always stop me. I will stop if you start waving a hand around. And then when it gets dark and I start showing you slides, um, you can just holler or I'll stop. Because I, it interests me. Is, the only reason I want to show stuff like this is not that I get off on it so much as that I want more people on my side and want, want you guys to go out and do some neat stuff. Um, but talk is cheap. Now the lights, okay? I'll show you what we did with some of these ideas. Don't you love this? If you push it down the middle, it becomes a hexagon. All right. Ta-da. That's where I live. I've lived in that for 10 years with Lady. We call it the silver turd. It's uh, 17 feet long. I won't show you the inside because it's just the way we did it in there. But it's, it's 17 feet long, has a bathroom, has a kitchen with six feet of counter space, 10 feet of desk, a wood stove, solar panel, and a uh, gas refrigerator right now, but it's getting a refrigerator. I've got to talk about refrigerators a second. When I'm teaching beginning engineering courses, I give my students the, as their first assignment to uh, design the stupidest possible refrigerator. And after a couple of days, they come and say, you know, I'm getting pretty close to what my mom has in the kitchen. <laughs> and I say, yeah, you bet. So you open the door, and the cold air falls out on the floor. Uh, the engine is underneath it. The engine's too hot to touch. That's putting the fire under the ice. Uh, the light bulb in there, uh, it was an incandescent bulb, is 94% um, heat, 6% light. If you count the cost of mining the coal and generating the electricity and so forth, it comes down that a common light bulb is 0.03 of 1% efficient. This from a nation that sends people to the moon, and for this, we have nukes to power these things. There's no point doing alternative energy stuff, though, if you don't, uh, if you don't deal with what's being powered as well. I'm going to show you a few things now quickly, show you how we do the work that we do, knowing that a lot of work need to be done around the country. I own a bunch of tools. We pull this thing with this, 
the white slug. Uh, it's an old bookmobile, a victim of Prop 13, but what's in it is a rather complete machine shop. Uh-oh, lost one. Come back. Ah! How'd it jump like that? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, this is a new Alchemy Institute. Now I'll start another part of the story. I've got two stories going here. I've got the biologists and the mechanics. You just saw some mechanic now for some biology. The new Alchemy Institute is on Cape Cod. It was started by people John Todd, Nancy Jack Todd, and William O. McLarney, Irishman extraordinaire, who were studying why fish were not reproducing. And they found that they were not reproducing because of all the chemicals thrown in the ocean. Male and female fish find one another by smell, and they can't, um, they can't smell each other if there's nasty chemicals in the water. So after they studied these things, they found that what they were doing was presiding at a wake. It would be sort of like studying the uh, shape of the, of the gash in the Titanic instead of trying to plug it when they saw it was sinking. So they decided they were going to try to do something about that. And so they, they founded this institute, which was to encourage people to find ways of living on the earth in a way that was sustainable, that you could keep doing, that wasn't keep using things up, but actually began regenerating. Some of you are familiar with Malcolm Wells' uh, criteria for architecture. He says that a building should purify air instead of dirtying the air. It should purify water instead of dirtying the water. It should capture the rain instead of dumping it. It should make food instead of using it. It should be regenerative if possible. He gives a scale on how you can judge buildings, any building you do in that way. Otherwise, any building you build is increasing the problems that we have. And this is not necessarily have to be. You can do it, uh, you can make buildings that don't, that don't mess the place up so badly. Anyway, they bought this old farm, this old dairy farm. The building on the right there, which looks a bit strange, is a bunch of fish tanks and is one of the very first solar greenhouses. This is a place that has 6,000 degree days. That's uh, unusual around here, but uh, it gets cold there. And the attempt was to do something about the outflowing of cash from Cape Cod. Cape Cod is much like an exploited, an imperialist possession, exploited. 96% um, of the food of Cape Cod is imported. If you think that's just because it's a Cape, 86% of the food eaten in Pennsylvania is imported from somewhere else. That means the money goes away from where you are. Consequently, Cape Cod, where all the rich people hang out in the summer, has the same poverty level as Appalachia in the winter. Almost 100% of Cape Cod's energy is imported for heat, light, whatever. We thought maybe we could do something about this. I wasn't a part of the New Alchemy Institute when this happened, when, the, when it started. A lot of gardens here. Started, I just want to show this. I know you didn't come here to see gar French intensive raised bed gardens, but I wanted to point out that this was done on beach sand and that it was done not to be labor intensive. There's a lot of talk about labor intensive, a very eco chic word these days, term. Labor and people who think labor intensive is good never include themselves in the proposed labor force. You ever notice that? This garden was designed so that 20 people could raise all their veggies in a year putting an hour and 20 minutes a week each into the garden during the gardening season. That ends up being about three and a half minutes of labor per adult serving of veggies and a very large variety of veggies at that. This is done entirely organically. No fertilizer, no pesticides, no herbicides. Question. Yeah. Why do you to not use the fertilizer and so forth? OK, the fertilizer is made from natural gas, most fertilizer in this country that clearly we can't keep doing that and the price of natural gas is going up dramatically. In this country we use uh, 10 big calories of fossil energy to make one calorie of food. Whereas in other countries they, use, they get 
one calorie of fossil energy get 10 calories of food, uh, but with a lot more labor input. So we're trying to cut down the fossil intake, but not increase the hand labor to a point where nobody would want to do it. Because let's face it, that nobody likes to go out there and hoe beans very much anyway. Gardens are fun, but they're not that much fun. Another question. We have hardly any loss. We don't count it a loss if there's a hole in a lettuce leaf, as long as the inhabitant of the hole isn't still there. And the idea of having flawless lettuce with no holes in it is a phenomenon only in the last 15, 18 years. The, 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 the uh, foil wrapped and, and plastic wrapped stuff in the Safeway has become popular. It doesn't hurt you to have something in the lettuce. One of the great beauties of this garden is you can pick food and, and not have to wash it because it doesn't have any nasty chemicals on it. You didn't, it's, people don't generally think of that. The, the uh, various pesticides are increasingly being proven not only to be carcinogenic and mutagenic in various ways, not, not, this is hard science is real, pretty well proving this, but we're finding that um, the, the soil is being ruined by this. For instance, we have 9% organic matter in this soil I, many of you probably don't know what that means. That is extremely huge amount of organic matter, and it's highly desirable. A test plot here that we farmed by normal methods was 2% organic matter and required this constant infusion every year. Also, we farm this in a way to not have erosion. A typical American field, farmer's field, loses nine tons of topsoil per acre per year. That's hard to believe, but it's true. And our topsoil is disappearing. My grandfather's farm in Iowa, when I was a kid, had eight feet of topsoil. That same farm now has eight inches of topsoil. How long can we do this? What happens when those eight inches are gone? Which is going to be soon. You know, we're going to live to see that. Okay, we decided we'd build a building where we could raise food indoors on Cape Cod. But the problem with the greenhouse business is that you have to have a big fossil fuel input to keep things from freezing in the winter. So we decided to see if we could make a building that you didn't have to do that. But the building itself was going to have to be fairly unique. Those, uh, this is, building is glazed in plastic. It's not as wiggly as it looks. That's the screen is wiggly. Um, the vertical members there are two by twos. My goodness, 26 feet long. And they're braced inside with wires just like ship masts. The plastic is double glazed. It's in those chutes, chute shaped. Uh, arrangements because that gives it strength. When you, when you give it section like that, it gives it strength so it doesn't rumble in the wind so badly. It does rumble a little bit. And uh, the snow goes down it. How thick is that plastic? Uh, it's about, uh, it's less than a millimeter. It's, uh, in California, they call it phylon. The fish tanks are made of the same stuff. This is actually Calwall Corporation's Sunlight 2, which is the best of that kind of plastic. The fish tanks there you see on the left are 600 gallons. They never freeze in the winter, even when it's 10 below zero, because the walls behind them and the chopped marble in the front reflect sunlight into the tanks. And also, the, in front of the greenhouse is machined in an angle so that when the snow is on, it acts like a big mirror and gives a 40% boost in uh, solar insulation, insolation, right? The other end of it. Those are curved to make mirrors. Is that in focus? No. Try another one. It snows there. I want to show you something about this. Yum. You can see the heat from the tanks by the melting snow. Yeah. Here's some example of an architect's not being too smart. The snow slides down, but there's not enough of a knee wall, so you have to shovel the damn thing over and over again. That's me shoveling it. I'm cursing. Uh, and also, one of the chutes is right over the door, so if you slam the door, you get buried in the half a ton of snow, <laughs> which is highly undesirable. Nonetheless, folks, inside at this moment, with no backup heat whatsoever, no electricity, no wood stove, no nothing, bananas. How about that? It is out of sight to waddle out there in waist deep snow and pick a banana and have no fossil input into that building at all. This took some doing. It took a lot of work. It took a crew of several hundred people, 
almost nine years to get this to work. A tuned ecosystem. I want to go inside now. This is how it works. Uh, the fish tanks store the heat. If they were ponds, they could only have solar intake on their surfaces. But by having them translucent, the sun can get into the water. We encourage the algae to grow. Algae turns out to be a really good selective black so that it does not re-radiate the heat radiantly, uh, but mainly by convection of air going by the tanks. So these tanks can hold millions of BTUs that they store up. We also have a rock bed, and there's a, a heat sucker that sucks the heat from the peak of the, of the arrangement, puts it down in the chopped rocks. They're about fist-sized rocks. In this, in this arrangement, it's pumped down by a, by a nuclear-powered, because we are powered by a nuke on Cape Cod, a nuclear-powered fan. I believe this may be nuclear electricity here, too. Um, up in San Francisco, our electricity is geothermal. <laughs> Pure as the wind-driven snow. Clean as a hound's tooth. Um, the, the rock bed, which is a standard rock storage bed design, um, runs the heat under the soil, thus heating the soil as the air is pumped out over the plants at night. Um, in the fish tanks, we raise algae-eaten fish. That is to say, tilapia, mirror carp, which they call back east mirror carp, and uh, yellow bullheads, which is a type of catfish. They eat at different levels. They're vegetarian fish. They eat low on the food chain. If you have meat eatery fish like trout, you have to feed them meat. And then you're getting into a big number, energetic number. But these fish eat algae. The same algae is in the tanks. The fish have exhaust. Some people call it fish shit. Uh, it's fish exhaust. Fish exhaust is ammonia. Ammonia is fertilizer. So we take 20% out of each tank, and incidentally, we are raising a fish per cubic foot of water, which is more than anybody else has ever done before, due to Bill McLarney's efforts at aquaculture. And the fish exhaust goes onto the garden, and the garden likes that. We also raise comfrey in the garden for dessert for the fish. Fish like comfrey. And we also feed it to the geese. This is why we call ourselves new alchemists. We turn comfrey into goose meat. It's all kinds of gold, lead into gold. It's all kinds of alchemy. Um, I personally did not like the presence of this nuclear powered fan in this arrangement. I also didn't like the wooden structure, craft and graft, but also it rots. And if you ever design a wooden greenhouse, attached or otherwise, you should consult with a wooden boat maker about how to make joints that do not suck in water and rot out later. You can't use various um, uh, chemicals to kill the uh, rot that gets into the wood, because that gets into the fish tanks and gets into the garden. Incidentally, in, this, in, the, in, in here, we're getting uh, entirely organically, we're getting the same output as a normal commercial greenhouse, except without any fossil fuel input and without any of the herbicides and pesticides. And we control the pests by means of integrated pest management. For instance, the scourge of greenhouses, white fly, we control with tiny little wasps. And um, Colleen Armstrong, our um, bug person there, uh, developed an interesting idea. She, de she deliberately raises greenhouse pests in the greenhouse, because if you have the enemies of the pests in there and they eat all the pests, then the enemies, the, the good guys, die. So we always have a little batch of bad guys in there for the good guys to feed on. And if there's an outbreak of bad guys, the good guys multiply and eat them up uh, or kill them in other ways. We have different decks in there. The back wall is slanted at the right angle to bounce the sunlight down into the, the plants. And we're, we get the, the seeds from Holland, where they have 25,000 acres of greenhouse in Holland. And one of the reasons I've been working on this is because uh, the Dutch have a problem. Their fossil fuel bill has gotten so high that it costs them more to raise veggies in Holland than it does to ship them from Israel by jet plane. 
and they can't double glaze their greenhouses because the structure won't take that. So we were trying to work with, a, with them on developing ways of double glazing the Dutch greenhouse. I'm working up to what we eventually did. This is over a long period of years, this stuff you're seeing. We tried another uh, arc too, which I'll show you in a minute. All manner of greeneries, giant tomatoes, yum. They're getting uh, 18 pounds a plant. That's pretty good tomatoes. Is there a scale limitation? How small can that greenhouse get? I'll show you. Uh, he asked, is there a scale limitation? How little can you make a greenhouse? We tried making a little uh, garden size one, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Here we're trying to do hydroponics using the fish exhaust directly to grow plants without soil. We raised plants in soil, French intensive raised bed, Rudolf Steiner, may he rest in peace, gardens, and which is an extraordinary way of getting big output, high output. We used the same seeds, we planted them the same day in the hydroponic bed as in the, uh, in the um, regular garden. Now hydroponics normally use a foul brew of chemicals from Monsanto or whatever. And this is just fish exhaust. We found the kooks and tomatoes grew twice as fast as the ones in the dirt or heavier. And we did a double blind test of, for taste. Uh, the people unanimously chose the hydroponic veggies. And we then did gas chromatography on them to see what the micronutrients were in them. And they indeed were more nutritious than the French intensive ones, which are much more nutritious than store-bought ones. So we're on to something there. And this work is just going on now. But this is a, a pretty neat idea. So we're getting huge outputs in very small space. Uh, this all, most of this work is done by apprentices who are not being paid. But you can get class credit for working there if you make arrangements with your school. This is compost. Compost makes carbon dioxide as it composts. And it also makes heat, helps heat the place. And we use the, f the fumes from it, of course, to give the plants the carbon dioxide they need. That's what they live on. And uh, we have in, in this greenhouse, by the way, 58 probes to a data logger, which have been running nine years now. Uh, monitoring everything from carbon dioxide, ammonia, oxygen, ambient air temperature, all that kind of stuff, soil temperature, different depths, water temperature. And um, all of that is fed into a computer so we can tell how much or how little to uh, aerate the water. The water is aerated by a, a, air, a wind, windmill air pump. We were measuring uh, carbon dioxide. We discovered the plants plant growth grew more, uh, the plants grew more on weekends. And we thought that was weird. And then we discovered that on weekends, when we give most of our tours, and it's all a, the tourists breathing in there, it made the plants grow better. Uh, we had a hurricane hit this and had to make some repairs. This is a repair crew out there. Those people are standing on two by twos, two inches by two inches, is supporting them out there. Why don't you think a minute now? about, I'll back up here, about what it would be like to live in a place like this. Uh, it's illegal in this democracy to live in a, a greenhouse. It's interesting. Behind every code, and you should remember this, behind every code is a sheriff with a pistol. It has been decided by the citizens of the United States that you can be driven out of a greenhouse at gunpoint if you care to live in it. But observe here an idea. What if up that ladder there was your bedroom, and up there to the right behind one of the fish tanks you had your stove, and maybe a couple of benches to sit on there, couch? There's all that nice oxygen there, all those pretty veggies. Not a bad place to live. People work in here in the winter in t-shirts and bathing suits when it's 10 below zero outside. And it isn't all that bad at night in there. The temperature swing is more than would be desirable in a passive solar home, obviously. On the other hand, a tomato can't put on a parka if it gets chilly. It is the moment of truth. Your solar building has to work. Thinking along those lines, we decided to talk to the Canadian government about building one of these things a thousand miles north of Boston on Prince Edward Island and to make it indeed a house. So after I get there in a minute, ta 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 That's a big one. It's a commercial greenhouse. And on the left-hand end, the bulge on the left-hand end is a home for a regular family who would operate the greenhouse. 
And Prince Edward Island, it's in, right near Nova Scotia, has to import all its veggies. It has very few trees because in the War of 1812, the English cut down all the trees to make a fleet to fight us. They didn't replant it. So all they do on Prince Edward Island is drink booze and raise potatoes. And they have the highest alcohol alcoholic rate of almost anywhere, almost 50% of the adult population is clinical alcoholics. This thing was designed to raise tree seedlings of hardwoods, trees. Uh, the lawn you see in front there is designed to reflect snow. Because we didn't know at the time that algae was a selective solar black, that line along the roof is a whole passel of active water fill collectors. Turned out they were not needed and they had never been turned on. But they were put in there because we didn't know any better at the time. Fish tanks, that's looking out to sea. Got to tell you about the fish tanks. They're really thin. They're like a beer can. They use the water structurally. You know, like a, a Coors can uses the Coors structurally. When the can's empty, you can crush it. When it's full, you can't. So these are really thin and floppy. You'll be seeing more of these. We invented how to make them uh, or your, yourself. If you, have to, if you buy them ready-made, they're very prohibitive because when you ship them, they're shipping a big piece of air and it costs you money to ship. That's opening day. The north side of the house is, is machined to jump the wind over the house. Opening day is the house part. Uh, by the way, uh, the Prime Minister came to this opening, first time he'd been in Prince Edward Island, and um, he came with no bodyguards or police or attaches or anything. He just walked in, not, not afraid of assassination or um, mad Iranians or whatever. If any of you are Iranians, I'm not meaning that as a slur. Uh, we had an interesting time building this. He was supposed to come and open the place, Trudeau did, and this was two days before he got there. And uh, this is the, I'll show you the next slide, is the same scene two days later. Same location. Now, how did we do that? What we did is we telephoned everybody we knew. <laughs> we had 160 people there working, feeding themselves, working free to get this done because we wanted to see it happen. We wanted to know if you could do that this far north. It turned out it was too popular. 15,000 visitors a year made it impossible to live there or do any work there. And the, some politicians called it a failure, consequently, and it was sold to a private fish farmer who's now operating as a fish farm. But it could have supplied almost all the vegetables for that end of Prince Edward Island, about a third of the population, from one building. And it would propagate 50,000 tree seedlings a year from this building. It is still doing that. From one building, 50,000 tree seedlings is a big deal. Especially, some of you may think that wood is a renewable resource. In this country, for every 100 trees cut, 10 are replanted, and one of those survives. That's how it's done here. And how long can we do that? You know? Think about that. It just can't go on. You know that you can't do that. Canada is beginning to cut the trees to sell to us. If you've been to BC lately, you'll notice some horrendous tree cutting. They leave a little strip along the highway so it still is photogenic. But if you fly over it, yuck. And they're in Canada, not only that, the consequent erosion washes the soil away and just leaves stone so that they will not replant. This has happened in this country you know, in New Mexico, where there's this cactus and sand, you've been around New Mexico a lot, some of you, seen it. In Kit Carson's day, which is 150 years ago, they complained that the grass was so high that on horseback you couldn't see over it. But cattle ranching ate the grass down and consequent erosion made it impossible for the grass to grow back and the climate changed as a consequence. So now they can't grow grass there. You're making desert. Yeah. And the idea of Greece now is like, you know, there's nothing really growing there. That's right. The, most of the Middle Eastern civilizations went down because they did what we're doing now. You can show, it's very easy to show that the Russian, uh, the, Russian the Roman civilization, the Greek civilizations went down because of 
poor agricultural practices primarily. China has trouble. They cut every tree in China. You go to China, there aren't any trees there. And Chairman Mao is having everybody plant a tree, but he didn't tell them to water it, so they all died. And uh, last year, they were ordered everybody plant 10 trees and water the suckers until they get big enough, and uh, it will go ill with the if you cut the tree for firewood. You know what a wok was designed so that you could cook dinner over one yak turd, dried yak turd, for fuel. It's a, it's a purpose of a wok is to be very fuel conserving. The Premier and John Todd. This is a tree propagating beds, some of the fish tanks. And uh, understand this, this is ha happening where it goes to 20 and 30 below zero. There's still no backup heat in here. This is the control room. This is the kitchen. How about that? You got your own herb garden and vegetable garden in the kitchen. Hmm? So you just reach out and nab a carrot. This kind of thing hydroponically can be done very reasonably. I, I have a friend in New Mexico who has a garden in his kitchen that's 8 by 10 feet. He grows 1,500 pounds of mix, mixed vegetables a year, including potatoes and strawberries, in his kitchen, three quarters of a ton, in what used to be his dinette indoors. Another view from the kitchen. More from the kitchen. Not bad. Has a little heavy hardware for the average kitchen there, the window openers. <laughs> uh, you can, I mean, this is the first one. We made it out of industrial equipment. We had no choice. It was expensive, too. This is the heat sucker that pulls the heat down from above. We put signs on everything so that the tourists can read and see what it all is. So we educate people when they come in and visit it but without having to talk to them. You get to real tired of talking to them. 15,000 people, that is the heat tube, madam. Yes, madam. We tell people uh, when they're using solar energy, they can, at noon when there's a lot of power coming in, you can only play fast pieces, uh, jazz and flight of the bumblebee, then it, towards evening you begin slowing down, then at night only funeral marches. <laughs> they say, how interesting. <laughs> this has a, a rock storage bed too. I should caution you something about rock storage beds. You read a lot about them, but they, if they get fungus in the rocks, you begin pumping fungus through the building and hurting people with it. Human beings are not good about fungus. So you have to use really clean rocks and you have to make sure nothing nasty gets in there on them. Well, I'm not sure how you do that and I consequently don't like rock beds and I would never use one. I would just, you can design a house so you don't need artificial means of heat storage like that other than maybe water tanks, fish tanks if you want to get into that. We had a window here cut with a glass over it so people can see the rocks. And be human, humane to the rocks, too. They can see out. I want to say a word here about fish tanks also. Uh, I fell off that scaffold up there with three other people. And you would be surprised, that's 20 feet, you'd be surprised at the maneuvers we made in the air to avoid straddling the uh, edge of a fish tank. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, uh, we did that all right, but landing in the, in the fish tank from that height, all rolled up in a ball, is like these guys in the carnival that dive 80 feet into a damp washcloth. But there's a trick to that. We didn't know what the trick was, and there's nobody to ask on the way down. Made it all right. And it didn't burst the tanks either, which we thought, sure, we'd burst the tanks. And they had 600 gallons of water on the floor real quick like. Anyway, there's a lot of fun in, in this. The old timers helping us, old Canadian carpenters and boat builders and so forth. We, they really got off on this. It was an amazing community effort. It was really a lot of fun. We learned an enormous amount doing this. Understand that this kind of passive stuff is fairly common now. You read about it in Solar Age magazine and so forth. This is the first one of these. It's easy to look back and say, oh, yeah. And when you're doing it, and I, by the way, had nothing to do with the design of this. I, I only helped pound a few nails in it. But um, the, to think it up the first time is not all that clear. And it's a real struggle. And we did a lot of really stupid things. But we had to, worry, we had to get into surface to volume ratio. How fast do you want the tanks to feed back the heat? Well, that depends on what diameter they are. If they're skinny tanks, most of the water is near the wall. So it can hand its heat back quickly. It can also take the heat in quickly. And the big fat tanks heat up more slowly. 
but they also give back the heat more slowly over a period of time. These arcs can go 10 days with no sun. And we have found in the 100-year history of the area that it had never gone longer than that with no sun. And in fact, the year that both of the arcs were built was the worst winter in recorded history in that era, in that area. And they, they did fine. So. Uh, 76. These are some of the fish. You can see the different colors of tanks. The tanks in the background have just been filled with tap water. The dark tank has been there a couple of days developing its algae. And the near tank with all the fish, baby fish in there uh, and eating the algae down, so it's changing color. And it's the blue doors near the top of the vents, and they open automatically thus. Eh? It snows here, too. And it's still a respectable temperature in there. I think that's neat. Yeah. The water in the tanks is not circulating. We tried circulating the water. We had what we called our enclosed rivers. We made indoor river, make the water go from tank to tank. We found just letting it sit in the tanks and siphoning it out worked better. Most of the place works by gravity. Very little pumping is done. We developed pumps, since you have to aerate the fish anyway. Uh, we developed bubble pumps that move the water around using the bubbles from the fish aerators to move the water. And we developed the bubble pumps by heating up plastic pipe and then stretching it suddenly, which made a venturi by getting it skinny in the middle, which drops the pressure. And then we let air go in there as the water rushes by. It sucks the air in it and uh, it put, or the, rather the, excuse me, the air goes through the venturi and we, it sucks the water in through little holes on the side and pumps the water. And we can get rather large uh, water volumes being moved that way, which is good for the fish. I like this picture, though. Boy, it has bad weather there. It's, it's a little unreal here tonight, you know, to think in these terms. But a lot of people live this way. I don't know why. <laughs> I should, as an aside to this, I was regaling a few people this afternoon. How I got interested in doing this stuff in the winter. I was stationed in Alaska in the military in a search and rescue team for downed aircrafts in the 50s when helicopters didn't have any range. So you couldn't use them for that. And sometimes we were, we'd ski like a 1,000 miles round trip to go get somebody and bring them back. And you had to haul your food doing that. And I got interested in hauling less food. So uh, because we were harnessed up to sleds like dogs pull us 600 pounds of food behind you is no, no fun So uh, on skis. So, I began experimenting where my calories went. And I discovered that breathing in the cold air, and it was heating up the air. And when I breathed out, the heat left with the air. So I was burning a huge amount of calories to keep my lungs, lungs from freezing. So I got an old gas mask and took the tubes and bent them down and put them in my armpits, holes in my shirt. Figure it was smelly, but it's, it's uh, good humidity. Now, when air is very cold, it doesn't have much water in it. So you, you dehydrate very rapidly in the Arctic. And when you dehydrate, you frostbite very easily. So by breathing um, a little pew from under the arms there, I cut down. It was is heating my intake air and humidifying it. I cut down my caloric needs 20%. So I carried 20% less food. Then I got interested in how I was losing heat and how the Eskimos were so much warmer than I was. And I got experimenting with, with uh, parkas and caribou hides and stuff. And I actually went outdoors once wearing only uh, house boots when it was 63 below zero. I went outdoors with just boots on to get some firsthand experience. And um, it's cold out there, all right. <laughs> then I made a foil suit out of aluminum foil, shiny side in, to see how much of my loss was radiant. And when you read Ashery, the American Society of Heating and Ventilating and Air Conditioning Engineers, whatever that is. You know the book. You, you people have to read it, I'm sure, or read at it. They don't talk much about radiant heat. In fact, Ashery misses a lot of important stuff. For instance, there isn't any literature worth mentioning on natural convection in buildings. It's all how big an air fan do you put in there.
you can you got directions on how to how to calculate how big the fan should be but not how to get along without the fan also ashery doesn't say much about radiant heat loss and it turns out radiant heat loss is worse than you think it is if you actually start dealing with it anyway so i got interested in making foil suits made of polyethylene underwear that's impervious to water and it's a little slimy inside but if you don't have the well now you can buy impervious um, no sweatsuits, they call them, that you put under your parka. It keeps you dry. It keeps you much warmer in, in low temperatures. Like if you, if you have cold feet, put a poly bag over your socks and put them back in the shoes. You will be surprised the effect of that. Or excuse me, put the poly bag on first, then into the socks. The poly bag's next to your feet. Sure, and wash your feet at night. Gag a buzzard otherwise. But you need to, and also you got foot rot, well, serious foot rot. <laughs> But anyway, you find out about this, you get a feel for it. You don't get the feel from books. And after a while, you begin to see. And I got interested, of, as an aside, I don't have any photographs of this, but it, it, when, you, when you live in the cabin in Alaska, you have to cut trees to heat the cabin. When you look from the air, you see the circle of cut trees around the cabin. Each year, the circle gets bigger, and pretty soon, the guy has to walk 100 yards to get a tree and drag it to his house. So they make that log cabins on skids, and they hire a cat DA to come and push the house closer to the woods every now and then. But I made a round log cabin by putting the logs endways in the ground in a circle. And with the same floor space, 35% less logs needed to heat it because it's round. And so much for the way settlers build log cabins. Is this tradition is silly. Most tradition is based on some sort of superstition or just not really thinking it out. And often, tradition results in the preventing of uh, innovation. For instance, traditional sailboats, yachts, are ruled by very artificial racing rule formulas. Consequently, really intelligently designed modern yachts are hard to come by. Bicycles, the same way, the beautiful racing bikes. You know, anybody here got a Colnago, you know, how beautiful, how delicate, how marvelous, and how stupid. What other serious machine has its bearings hanging out in the air and the dirt and all its vital organs hanging right down there where sand and grit and salt gets in it and tires that you can pop by running over a grass seed? Ah, oh, come on. And this is because the, the Union de Cycliste in France will not recognize bicycles that have aerodynamic shells that aren't the traditional diamond frame that have, don't have the wheels the same size and all that kind of stuff. Well, they're getting pressure now to change that. And you're finding right here in River City some of the uh, new bicycle developments. People going 60 miles an hour on bicycles you know, is something new coming in on bikes. I'm working on a bike now, too, in the humble shop I showed you. A bike specifically designed for commuters on the idea that people don't commute on bikes too much because, for one thing, the, one of the stupidest possible designs for a commuter is the common 10 speed. You ride with your nose on the ground, and if you hit a pothole, a wheel collapses, and all kind of dumb stuff that should really be worked on. OK, here's your little one. This one we call a six-pack, because it looks like a row of things. We bulge the plastic the other way in these. And that uh, a little uh, Savonius rotor, that windmill on the roof is called, it was designed originally to stir stock watering troughs so that they didn't ice over and the cows couldn't get any water in the fall but we use it inside to stir the water. We tried doing this one without fish tanks, but using a fish pond on the inside. That's the pond. And that's that rod coming down into the tray there. It spins the tray and throws water out of the tray centrifugally. And the, the, the tray gets its water by a tube going 10 feet down to the bottom of the pond. So as it throws it out centrifugally, it refills. And this circulates the water in the pond and keeps a good temperature gradient in it and distributes the nutrients around to the fish. But we found that the pond's surface just was not enough to collect enough solar energy to do the deed. Were you, uh, yeah. were you insulating uh, against the soil? Yes, we, insu we edge insulate the uh, R30 down below the frost line in all that you have to do that here. And um, in this building is the first use of heat mirror. We have on the underside of those arched panels three layers of heat mirror, which is a transparent plastic, very thin, uh, that 
is a, is allows shortwave infrared from the sun to go through, but it stops longwave infrared from going back through it. So it's called heat mirror, and you can buy that now only inside of windows, inside of double glazing. And there's some problems with heat mirror, one of which is that air hurts it. So it has to be inside of sealed windows. But I'll show you some more about heat mirror in a minute. And also heat mirror is the coming thing. that You're going to hear a lot more about heat mirror in coming years. And it's companion cloud gel, which is a heat heat mirror that when it gets beyond a certain temperature, it goes opaque automatically and blocks the sun. So it prevents things from getting too hot. And this uh, last month's Popular Science magazine has a bit about cloud gel in it. And this stuff really does work. And um, we've making some good use of it. As with many things right now, it isn't working very well. This is a, there's a phenomena that happens when you're doing experimental work is that the last of the old, which is highly developed, is never as good as the first of the new, which is not highly developed. But the new stuff, if it's any good, has a better potential and will eventually be good and supplant the old. And you have to be willing to make some mistakes and to have things not go your way every time. It's sort of like the hole in the cabbage leaf. Uh, it's one of those things. Nature makes holes in cabbage leaves. So how do you see your, your work? you see it like uh, yourself as a scientist and these are like almost like laboratory experiments? These are laboratory experiments done by amateurs. I've got to tell you why they're done by amateurs, except we're really pros. It, you know, just in the same way that in the 60s, we were known as the counterculture but we were not the counterculture, we were the culture. And the people trying to kill us with hydrogen weapons were the counterculture. They just had the wrong name. Have you ever noticed a weird thing like they call the sun alternative energy? Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> you know, if, if you, I don't have a blackboard up here, but you know what a pie chart looks like? You know these pie charts and they show energy, oil so much of the pie and coal so much of the pie. And then they have this little thin strip for solar, but they leave out raising our food. And if they added that in there for solar, it'd be mostly solar in this little thin strip for fossil fuel over the edge. But the, the, we've been trained to not think of solar as our life force. And the very idea that the word environmentalist is a position, you can't take that as a position. You got no choice. If you're gonna grab it and run and leave it go to hell, you're, so you're a veritable miner. You, you mine the earth, and the hell with your children. Doesn't matter if they have anything left after you're done. I saw an Eldorado, by the way, two days ago, Eldorado convertible, whose license plate was own all, which I thought was at least honest. Uh, anyway, I am not an environmentalist. I live here, it's my earth, yours too. We gotta take better care of it than we've been taking care of it. And um, this is the biology, and I'm gonna get back to the mechanics in a minute, because this was done before I came to New Alchemy. I didn't know about this then. But we got into a contest of who has come up with the best piece of, uh, of appropriate technology these days. And uh, I, the group I was working with won it for a mechanical thing and I, that we'd done, a new kind of solar collector. And, and John Todd sent pictures to Ark and said, how about this? And we thought it was sort of airy-fairy, you know, French intensive, you know, what's next, pyramid power? You know, we were very derisive of it. Little did I know, and I had to really eat it on that one because I was wrong. And we end up working, be, getting to be friends and working together. there. He said, you're just not paying attention. And this is a windmill we designed and built that uses very low wind. When you read wind energy books, they tell you if the wind is less than 10 miles an hour, you can forget it. This thing pumps water like mad at four miles an hour, and it costs $200. It pumps more water than an $8,000 commercial windmill, but it requires a keeper. You gotta watch it and furl it if the wind gets too much. It's a sailboat. It's three sailboats chasing each other in a circle. The pump it pumps, by the way, is, is a a tire that is full of water that it squeezes flat, squeezes the water, and then sucks in more water through one-way valves, and it works pretty well. And um, this is another one that students of mine built. It's a sail wing windmill. We talked to a guy from Africa who says if you put steel sails on a sail wing, it doubles its power instead of using cloth. So we tried that. And this machine, which is 16 feet in diameter, 
can easily hoist two full-grown people off the ground on its sucker rod. And we bought a set of Mexican blacksmith's tools from a Mexican blacksmith and built this machine using Mexican blacksmith's tools so that Mexican blacksmiths can be sure to build the machines in Mexico to pump the water out of rivers into the fields. Uh, in China, when I visited in China recently, I saw a whole line of people sitting on a riverbank, about 100 people. I wondered what they were doing. And I noticed one person kind of bopping up and down at the end of the line. They were on a treadmill. One guy, when he pooed out and got worn out and fell over, the next guy moved up and took over. They were pumping water out. They would have liked this. <laughs> by the way, the tail on this machine, which you can just barely see there, is three by eight feet, and I framed it in half-inch EMT conduit, soft electric conduit, and just put a very thin sheet of metal over it, 28-gauge uh, um, metal. It's a little thinner than hot air ducking. And that three by eight was so strong, the two strong people at each end of it cannot twist it. It's absolutely rigid, amazing. It's sort of like your box panels that you have for the floors in your balcony here. They're not legal necessarily. This is a, another kind of wind machine. I'm just throwing these in here to show you that we've been doing some wind machine stuff. This kind of wind machine did not work very well. Uh, that's a geodesic tower, by the way. And that works well, except for one thing. When you're on the tower, there is nothing vertical. And you don't know the meaning of the word vertigo. We used to joke, uh, have you vertigo? No, I'm almost uh, to the ground. <laughs> uh, har, har. <laughs> uh, falling off of towers is an undesirable occupation. And I end up hanging from my harness once. I greatly dis dislike this tower. Uh, and uh, anyway, this is a big machine that we made. And uh, it was a failure cost $65,000. It was an experiment. It failed. It failed because the engineers who engineered it, which I'm glad wasn't me, riveted the aluminum wings together with steel rivets and they made galvanic corrosion and the thing flew apart. It's criminal negligence in a sense, I think. I, I was not pleased by that. All right, it didn't go. What's happening? Huh. Okay, I want to show you some other interesting experiments. This is another way to build a dome. You stand up a bunch of these, and then you put rings at the, at the top and you close it like a, a, a sack with a drawstring. You can buy plywood 12 feet long. You know that? You can buy it longer than that even. And you bend them down with a come along in the middle, shingle it. You get that? Owl feathers. It's a cheap house. It's a perfectly good house. It costs 300 bucks. And it worked nicely, too. It's a very pleasant space. Uh, the guy cut the curves by eye, and the place was known as the Temple of Accumulated Error. <laughs> the space inside did not leak. No. That's a nice house. Illegal. Staples. Um, you guys know what, guys and Gaius is, uh, do you know what Tyvek is? It's the stuff DuPont makes. It's like Gore-Tex only, it's for houses, like a Gore-Tex raincoat. Won't pass wind, won't pass water, but it will pass water vapor. And it comes in gigantic sheets. It looks like typing paper, but it's so strong you can't tear it barehanded. It's really tough stuff. It's cheap, too. You can use it on the outsides of houses to waterproof them. It's much better than building, building felt. And then if your vapor barrier isn't perfect, the insulation won't get wet because it does pass water vapor. And uh, Tyvek, T-Y-V-E-K. And what I use, incidentally, for vapor barrier on the inside of houses is a stuff called Too Tough, which looks like polyethylene, but isn't. And it's incredibly strong. It doesn't cost hardly any more, and it's really hard to rip. And so if you bump it accidentally, the carpenters hit it or something, it doesn't rip and, and make leaks in your vapor barrier. Um, so 
This is the infamous Pacific High School. It was a, a counterculture high school that was not accredited. Turns out that doesn't matter because no college asks you if you graduated from an accredited high school. That's not on the form, and I bet it isn't on the form here either. <laughs> um, so we had their people who were kids who were incorrigible. Some of them were rated incorrigible by the sheriff's department. They shot their daddy or something. Many of the kids had been thrown in jail by their own parents. The parent finds a joint in the kid's uh, bureau and the kid's at school and then calls the sheriff and has his own kids sent to jail. These kids are filled with hate. So they had to build their own dormitories because some rednecks who didn't like hippie kids burned the school bus and then we couldn't buy another one because the insurance company wouldn't insure it. It's a felony to drive an uninsured school bus, yada da yada. So the, we said, well, why don't you try, let's try building some domes. And um, so a couple of us came in there to show the kids the geometry and these incorrigibles, who supposedly were criminals beyond all hope of recovery, began building their own places. And this is somebody who just got finished cutting a bunch of struts. Uh, we had a good time putting them together. Uh, I'd hoped to have a picture of Peter Calthorpe here, but that turned out not to be that. My eyes aren't what they used to be. But it was very teamworky. I mean, just heartrending. Very, uh, very nifty. These were plywood domes. We didn't know any better. The hubs are made of crate strap on pieces of pipe. Do not use plastic pipe for this kind of thing. It cold creeps. A cold creep is not somebody who isn't doing well on the dance floor. It is uh, that plastic very slowly does the glacier. Even aluminum does that, by the way, if you push on it hard enough. We got imaginative about the window patterns. Um, we got these past code. Mm -mm. They leaked. This one we made of aluminum. Now here's a 30-foot diameter dome that weighed 180 pounds. And it withstood a wind of 90 miles an hour without damage. And it's made of, we, we uh, signed up, four of us signed up for uh, a career change course offered by the San Jose Chamber of Commerce for people who are out of work. We learned aircraft sheet metal. Cost us $1.75 to register. And it helped to speak Spanish. <laughs> now, the only Spanish I can speak has to do with bending aluminum. <laughs> and I've forgotten most of that. I have to brush up on that, though, because uh, it's silly to be a Californian now and not know how to speak Spanish, so I'm going to have to get on it. We made the, the line of windows there went across in a great circle arc of the winter sun. And uh, then we shot foam on the inside of it to stiffen it, and then shot gunite concrete on the inside of that. So it didn't weigh 180 pounds anymore, but it still was neat. And um, I like this picture because there was more than one way to cut a vent when we found the vents weren't big enough. <laughs> that was fun. That dome uh, would support your weight, believe it or not, but you had to spread yourself thin like an amoeba uh, and go by pseudopods across its surface if you wanted to work on it. We taped the joints uh, with the kind of tape they wrapped gas pipes with before they put it underground. It worked pretty well. Not great. But these are kids doing this, mind you, 14-year-olds. And it's the first time these were done. Nobody up to this time had built small-scale abode domes to live in of this sort of thing. It's all experimental. And then with the kids, we wrote the books on how to do this. Uh, it was sort of hippy-dippy. A little starry-eyed, bit of hype. But it was all right. It was good fun, and we learned a lot. And we also learned how to publish. So nobody published anything like that, so we published it ourselves. We learned how to do cut up, paste up, typing, and all that kind of stuff. And um, so that was fun. And then there was this one. We decided to try making a greenhouse. And underneath this structure is 40 tons of manure. And when it rots, it makes heat, it keeps the place warm at night. Every now and then you renew it, we thought. Uh, turned out people weren't much into renewing it. But it got us thinking on how to make domes. 
uh, that were transparent. These are vinyl. At the time, we didn't know about vinyl chloride being a carcinogen. When we found that out, we stopped doing this for a while, for, in fact, 10 years. And I'll show you some more that we did with it at the time. Notice the shadow pattern on the floor. A typical greenhouse is 25% shadow. These are 4% shadow. In the winter, growing in greenhouses is light limited, not so much heat limited, as long as the plants are reasonably warm. And the main thing is to give them light. So that difference in percentage of shadow is a big difference. And here's where we start doing computer analysis of how do these shadows move and did certain plants be in shadow all day or how long were the plants in shadow, that kind of thing. Began working up programs to be able to determine that kind of thing. The computer is very good for that. Very, very poor to do it by hand without a computer, believe me. Then I had the idea of using EMT tubing for a dome frame. I'm really tired of people putting up frames with no skin on them or saying, oh, to put a parachute over it, man. So we decided to, we went to a factory in San Francisco that I regret to say made inflatable women that sold through adult bookstores. <laughs> with or without motor and heater. But we figured this dude knew how to make vinyl shapes. <laughs> he also made vinyl chaperones for women who didn't like driving through the city without a man in the car, so he has male torsos that you just put a coat on and a hat on. These kind of bouncy looking dudes looking out the window there, they're really creepy. I have a friend that put one of them on the back of his motorcycle and let it go back and forth. <laughs> People kept thinking it was falling off on the street. He faked a fight with it one day and whipped out a knife and stabbed it and exploded and people just about fell dead on the sidewalk from horror. <laughs> anyway, we went to this guy and we said, can you, can you think you could make triangular vinyl pillows? Because we wanted it insulated and we didn't want it flapping. Huh? So, we put air mattresses, titty valves in the corners, kind you bite, pull out, and then blow in and push it back, or pull it out, rather. And that make a pretty neat detail. We put it together with eye bolt through the center, a ring bolt. You can hang 400 pounds from each hub. That's what it looked like. Now, you notice that from the, from the second horizontal up down, you can't see in there. This is was purposeful, we made that part of it translucent. We had the idea of having two floors, one at the bottom and one at the next level. And here's an, here's an idea why I'm bringing this up. You know, when you walk into a regular house, the dining room says, I am your dining room, and here is the table, and here is the chairs, and we eat here. That's all you do. And the rest of the day, you're paying the mortgage on it. I've got to talk about mortgages a second. The average house in San Francisco these days the average house, used house, not a new house, 117000 You pay $340,000 for that house. The first eight years you pay, pay for the house. Then you pay 22 years to pay this rip-off bank. This is a gigantic amount of money that they supposedly have this huge interest because of the risk that they're going to lose money on your house. <laughs> See, so you work 22 years to pay the bank the interest and only eight years would have paid for the house. That's the one reason I don't live in a house. That silver turd means I didn't pay any rent for 10 years. That means I had the money to do the things I'm showing you here and still had enough money to travel around a lot, have my kid in school and all that kind of stuff. Even had a nice car. Uh, show you how we ventilated this. Because uh, I'm talking low income housing. Here's looking up from the bed, and at the touch of a string, by means of a spring, ta-da, and ta-da. I could open the whole dome that way, you know, if I wanted to. A lotus idea. Okay, anyway, the idea here was that the second story at the top edge of that opaque area there, or translucent area, which we never got built, because um, we got into something else. And it was also a little too small when we actually got it built. It didn't quite feel right at the next time. Anyway, you come into the dome and there's nothing in it 
wall-to-wall -wall carpet, and it's empty. Where's the bed? Trap doors in the floor raise up as a water bed. When you're done with it, shut it down. Where's your couch? Station wagon back seats in the floor. Flip up with leg room, talk, you're done, you want to dance, put the couches away. Where's the kitchen? One step down. When you're done with it, shut the door on it. So you come in, instead of the house saying, here is your living room, here are the two windows exactly spaced, so here is where the couch goes, and all that kind of stuff. I come in and say, space, I bought you, I'm the master, tonight we dance. I want a kitchen. A kitchen comes to me. I'm sick of the kitchen. The kitchen leaves. I don't see any reason you can't do that. I think what's coming up, maybe not using that kind of technique, is smaller houses. It's easy to see now that a 53 Buick Roadmaster is a silly sort of car. It has a certain campy appeal, I admit. But as an automobile, it was horrible. It is more difficult to see that most of the time what we call a nice house is a Buick house. 2,700 square feet for two people, indeed. Bedrooms that spend most of their time sleeping, but with nobody in them. At 340,000 bucks, that is not a good way to go. Why is it, have you ever noticed? Why for is it that low income housing doesn't exist? There isn't any low-income housing. It's because if you build houses, craft and graft, and you finance it through rip-off banks, you end up with a $340,000 house that is a Buick house, and I would suggest is amoral, if not un unpatriotic, and it's eating up our forests, and it's doing all kind of other nasty stuff. I'm not saying you have to live in a dome. I'm saying we've got to start thinking of other ways of doing this. And the time is now, and who's going to have to actually execute that kind of stuff is you, because my generation messed it up, because we were trained to mess it up. Some of us got away with our tail feathers, but that doesn't mean that through and through we, you know, there's a part of me that really wants a gullwing Mercedes. Well, I'm hoping that's what's being done here, but I don't know about that yet. The, what I'm doing, I'm training myself. And the people I work with, we trained ourselves. And most of us start out as artists, as uh, biologists, people with an appreciation for aesthetic, for natural order, and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah a, lot, a lot of things are showing they seem to be rural. Okay, they're all like out in the boondocks. And, and when you talk about uh, uh, housing, what's that idea of putting uh, okay. people who need to work in the city? Okay. In the country, you've got to talk about urban solutions. Yeah, I'm not talking about putting this kind of thing in the city, but you could certainly have a tiny apartment. Like, if you ever go to Finland, eh? they got apartments in Finland, you wouldn't believe, with four people, and in their nice house, they're built like yachts inside. The chairs have drawers under them and all kind of neat stuff. And like in my own house, my dish, dish rack is a drawer with a drain pipe on it, so when I take the dishes out of the sink, put them in a drawer, they're gone, and I don't have to keep manipulating dishes. And it's an interesting thing. You ought to keep a diary of how you spend your time. You find in your, in, if you live to be 80, you've spent seven years doing dishes or something like that. It's not a good thing for people to do. I mean, we're not dogs and cats or something like that, that all we do is, is do bodily functions. We're supposed to use this ear separator for something other than thinking where our next meal is going to come from. Otherwise, we're just no better than the dogs and the cats. Anyway, I th to the urban scene, to do in L.A., you know, is really not a good thing to do uh, for a whole lot of reasons. But a lot of what I'm showing you here, we did it in the country because codes wouldn't permit us to do it in the city. But codes are just something written on a piece of paper and they can be unwritten again. It's like tax credits, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And, he, and uh, Social Security, you're never going to see Social Security. The bucks you put into it, you're never going to see that. I'm not going to see mine. Um, hmm. Okay. This is one, another modification of this idea which we did on Bucky's Island off the coast of Maine. And this dome, uh, which weighed 600 pounds, withstood four direct hits by hurricanes with winds above 130 with no damage. That house in the background, which was built in 1680, ah, old house. The people in that house, who is the descendants of the people who built it, Lobstermen. Um, 
came and hid in the dome in one of the hurricanes because they thought their house was going to leave the foundations. And this dome was sitting there. They said when they were in it, they couldn't hear the wind. It didn't even wiggle. And this was just made as a, a, a sort of a guest house. We made a floor in it to put a four inches of styrofoam down, planks on the, and then um, masonite on it laid the other way to get it above water level. It's an insulated floor, just cost the cost of it, no nails, nothing, just held in there by gravity. If water ran underneath it, didn't hurt anything, it worked fine. Okay, this is in New Mexico. These are silo tops, big ones. They're cheap, 3,000 bucks. They're light, they come in one truckload, one pickup truckload at that. That's my kid back then. Some experiments with solar energy. This is at 8,000 feet in New Mexico in an exposed location. This is how not to make solar collectors. Outgassing black paint etched the glass. You can see it, ruined the glass. 2,000 bucks, damage. Here's our wind machines. We decided to see if we could run a ranch 100% solar, no fossil fuel, not even a barbecue. Electric pickup truck, electric windmills. That tower on the windmills is on is an old crane boom we bought from a contractor going out of business. And how we got it home is we welded an axle on one end of it and a trailer hitch on the other and put taillights on it and drug it home as a trailer. And um, the pickup truck, which is a, can hold a thousand pound load, is little, it's a little old industrial electric truck, uh, golf cart clone that uh, it turned out it had 900 pounds of useless uh, fenders and junk on it. So I gave it an aluminum body, made it 900 pounds lighter. But it had a 12 mile range, very powerful going up hills and stuff. And we used it around the lot. We call it the wind mule. And um, those are antique wind machines that we put up there. Anyway, we succeeded in running a complete machine shop, welding waves refrigerators, microwave ovens, the whole schmear, entirely wind and solar. Wind energy, solar energy, you know about that. I don't have to belabor that point. And um, neat thing about these domes, boy, doesn't that look like a Martian attack? Um, that, that stone layer there, I made it, made it angle so that it venturis the winter wind and scours the snow away that falls off the dome so you don't have to shovel it. And uh, the domes have their own solar collectors built into their surface. And the new one, this one they're standing next to, which I did not show because the patent hasn't come through on it. And uh, we found that these domes, uh, here, it's going to be hard to believe, but these domes with one air change an hour and two people inside it at 25 below zero can be kept at 70 degrees by one Aladdin lamp kerosene lamp. It's 5,000 BTUs an hour. Most formulas, 10,000 BTUs an hour is considered noise in the formula, noise in the calculations. So we're running these places so that we didn't need those solar collectors. You say, well, what about when it gets hot? In the summer there is 115. Totally exposed desert. The domes inside stayed at 83 degrees with all the doors and windows open. People say, well, that's because they're insulated. When we put up one of these, before we insulated it, we did our little trick, which we learned from Bucky, how to turn a dome into a self-cooling device. You could fry an egg on the outside, and inside is 83 degrees without any insulation when it's 115 outside. How can this be? You have a hole in the top. You have vents around the base. If you make them in exactly the right proportion, cold air comes in the top and pushes the hot air down and out the bottom vents. Uh, you don't believe me. I had engineers stand in the place and say, you got a hidden refrigerator in here. Bucky said this would work. He called them chilling machines. They do work. You can do that without any fans, without any evaporators, without any cooling coils, without any of that stuff. It can be done. But you have to have a building that induces its own air currents inside. And the way air currents like to go is the atomic mushroom cloud, torus, rolling donut. And if you have a, sur a curved shape, that will occur inside it, all by itself. Not only that, 
in the summer or the winter. The dome is the same temperature from the very top to the bottom within one degree with no fans blowing, which means if you used a dome for a greenhouse, you wouldn't need that fan I didn't like back there a ways. And moreover, it would naturally circulate air over the plants, which plants like. Yeah. Okay, that has to be adjusted. I, I have not have a reliable math on that. <coughs> I found that um, it is better to have adjustable vents and tune it. And you can. It is really weird, though, to, to light light something smokable and watch the uh, smoke go down. And uh, I mean, we had the editor of Popular Science come there, and he wouldn't write an article on it because he said. This can't happen because all the books say this doesn't happen. I'm not going to write an article on it, even just standing there and watching it happen. So those of us who are into Bucky call this the item M effect because Bucky had it sketched on a piece of paper that said item M at the top. And I'm currently, in fact, just this morning, I harassed Bucky's archivist, uh, his grandson, to try to get me the numbers on that. Several universities did research on that, but they never published it. Urgh. So we're going to find out about that. <coughs> yeah, that's true. Now, understand, these things are incredibly light. You could put one of these on the roof of an apartment house. You could put a lot of this stuff on roofs, indeed. Anyhow, what I'm getting at here, don't you see, through all of this, through the stuff that the new alchemists had done up until now, and the stuff that I've been working on up until now in this picture, all that about 10 years old, <clears throat> we, had, we had begun saying that instead of opposing nature, the ultimate way you're going to conserve energy and to be a good steward of the earth is not to get off on your ego expressing yourself in steel and stone and putting Parthenons on the front of cars and stuff like that, but is to find out how nature wants to do it and help nature do that instead of opposing nature. You know, here in L.A., you have all this trouble with floods if there's a, a big rain and you pipe all the water quickly to the sea and then you try to drag water down from Northern California to take its place so you can drink. Is that stupid or not? Not to mention the sewage. One of the things we were doing at New Alchemy, Cape Cod has what's called a lens under it. That is to say that the fresh water floats on the salt water that's under the Cape from the ocean. And as you draw from the lens, the, the salt water comes in. Cape Cod's population is going to quadruple in the next 20 years if it continues growing at the rate it's growing. The water isn't there. So what do they do with their sewage? They do the stupidest possible thing to do with the sewage. All right, you know, if you collect all of your own poop, your exhaust, your solid exhaust, for a whole year and dry it out in the sun downwind, <laughs> You know what? It fills two shoe boxes, two Adidas boxes. And each one of you uses between 15 and 30,000 gallons of purified drinking water to dilute two shoe boxes full of poop, to send it to a sewage plant where their big job is to make this effluent into acceptable water again for whatever reason, or pump it out into the ocean, <coughs> and then truck it down, down from Northern California or whatever not too smart. What we proposed at the New Alchemy Institute on Cape Cod was to, to process the effluent by means of biological uh, breakdown things under transparent covers and then pump the effluent out into the forests and raise firewood on Cape so that people wouldn't have to import fuel. And then that would recharge the water table with good water because the trees would purify the water. Trees automatically purify water. They're considering it. They may actually do this. The uh, Cape and Islands Cooperative. Okay. At New Alchemy, we build a dome. Now I'm starting to bring the things together. We built a dome many, many years ago, 10 years ago, hippie dome, made out of this uh, phylon, but the phylon slowly gets less and less transparent. Finally, this dome was only passing 40% sunlight and it got rot between the layers. So we decided to tear it down and replace it with another one. Turns out they die hard. We had to beat it to death. What a mess. <laughs> one of the reasons we're making this big mess here, though, now the gal on the right 
in the blue, the rightmost gal is my lady, Liz, who's a horticulturist and artiste. Um, we got a live fig tree in there, been there a long time. We're trying to save it. We're going to build a new structure around it. We got people into it, and we're trying to keep it from falling on the fig tree. That's the fig tree all bundled up there. We like fig trees. Wow, is that a brew? Uh, ha, ha, ha. Yum. Okay, so we did edge insulation, 30 inches of foam in a slot in the ground, which we dug with a ditch witch and by hand, depending. Then we started building a dome. We're going to build another pillow dome now. But I had an idea, which was to build a pillow dome out of non-toxic plastic. So I consulted with DuPont, and they said, how about Teflon? You can get Teflon in sheets, not just in fry pans. <laughs> and um, they said, in fact, why don't you use Tefzel? Tefzel is the most insulative, electrical insulative material there is. I don't know whether that's the yinist or the yangist material, but anyway, it, it is the ultimate. It is not degraded by sunlight at all. It is not degraded by cosmic rays. It is used in spaceships as the separators of the plates and their batteries. Then I was looking at a table of the periodic elements there thought if I make these pillows three layers instead of two and I pump them up with argon which is 30 percent better insulator than air because the argon is slow the little argons go very slowly it's an atomic gas and they don't jive around so much as air molecules do so it doesn't conduct heat as quickly it's also inert also if you stabbed a pillow let's say you lit fire to a pillow the argon would come out and put it out it's non-toxic it won't hurt you if you breathe it though you won't get far if that's all you breathe and um, so, and we had found this old aluminum dome that nobody wanted anymore, an aluminum dome frame. So we decided to make up a set of pillows, uh, and we approached DuPont on this, and they gave us 50,000 bucks because what they said is, oh boy, if this works, then we can sell uh, 25,000 acres, three layers thick of Teflon to the Dutch to, to uh, fix up their greenhouses. And we'll get these guys to work for us for cheap. That wasn't enough money, so we went to the National Endowment for the Arts, and we said, we're going to make this dome, Bucky's Garden of Eden Dome, that he had projected so many years ago at the now defunct Black Mountain College, a noble experiment. But he drew it up, never built it. And it was obvious Bucky was getting near the end of the line. I really wanted to build him a Garden of Eden Dome that he could live in. We never got that done, but we did get this one done. And we began getting people interested in doing it that knew nothing about it went through this bit with the models. There's a lot more to this model bit. I could, I could do a four hour lecture just on that, but you'd all fall out of your chair. Um, so we started putting it together. We made all of the parts in the truck, in my truck. Mass produced them with jigs, very accurate. Hinges, this is anti, uh, this is zinc paint. You ever seen zinc paint? It, it is 97% zinc. Only you can brush it. <coughs> it's better than hot dip galvanizing metal uh, mill spec. And there's the Tevzel pillows, handmade. Oh boy, do they cost! They're 90 bucks a piece, handmade. But if they were stamped out, they wouldn't be much. They're a five thousandths of an inch layer. That's like five mil polyethylene. Five thousandths of an inch, about like typewriter paper. Then two mils on the inside. Then five mils on the outside. Three layers for the same reason you triple glaze any window. It's super, super transparent because Teflon. The three layers of Teflon is more transparent than one thin layer of good, good low iron glass for solar use. You use glass with low iron. So when you look at the edge of it, it isn't green. Yeah. And uh, Tevzel has a very interesting attribute. It passes ultraviolet light without stopping it. Glass doesn't. A normal greenhouse doesn't have any ultraviolet in it. That's one of the reasons plants in greenhouses have trouble with fungus and rot, because the ultraviolet isn't in there to kill it. So now we're going to make a greenhouse you can get a sunburn in, and, and, and ultraviolet will be in there. 
I should explain why have a dome for a greenhouse. Well, domes not only have the least skin area to lose heat through because they're hemispherical or part, some part of a sphere, <clears throat> they, on the inside, they're roughly the shape of a headlight, you know, a reflector. So if they have a reflecting quality to them, they reflect the energy back in, into themselves. Also, they're smooth. There's a term called laminar flow. When air flows over or water flows over something, if it doesn't burble and make turbulence, it is laminar flow. You ever flown in a jet plane, you see those little fences on the wings that look like little combs sticking out little blades? That's to smooth the flow out so it doesn't break loose from the surface and make turbulence. <clears throat> so you want laminar flow. Excuse me. Far out. <sighs> um, so uh, the dome makes a laminar flow over it and Indeed, it speeds up the wind, so the wind is going, when a one mile an hour wind to the ground is like three and a half, four miles an hour at the top of any dome. You could put a wind machine there, that's something we didn't do, but someday, have it make its own electricity that way maybe, or run some pumps. But the air going over it smoothly doesn't disturb the boundary layer that sticks to the dome. You ever see the Goodyear blimp, you know? You notice its engines are out on sticks at the side? That's because the Goodyear blimp has this boundary layer that goes through the air with the blimp. And if the engines didn't stick out beyond that, the blimp wouldn't move. Because <laughs> it'd be, be inside itself, be like trying to make a bathtub move by paddling the water in it. <laughs> so you, to keep a house warm, you want the boundary layer to stay with the house. Well, observe on a regular house, you have the eaves sticking out, you know, the soffit and all that stuff, fascia. That's a sneer, too. A sneer. Anyway, it sticks out there. It catches the wind. And rubbing on the house there, it breaks the boundary layer. And where does it rub? It rubs at where the roof meets the wall. In a regular house, the, the heat is stratified in the house. It's hottest there. The heat transfer is the greatest from where it's hottest to where it's the coldest. So outside it's the coldest, where the wind is rubbing, inside it's the hottest, you got the biggest heat loss there. And when you do those thermogram photographs of a house, you see there's the big heat losses along the eaves. The insulation settles there too, doesn't help a bit. But the dome is smooth and the air just flows over it. You know? Smooths off all the snow too, it doesn't build up on it. That's why they use them for the radar domes up in the north is supposed to tell us that we have 15 minutes to live. So, and the dome circulates its own air inside. So those are reasons to use it. And here we go, a building it. We're getting everybody out here. New Alchemy to save money uses senior citizens for secretaries, 70 years, 70 years old. Ladies, we have them out there working rivet guns. <laughs> They loved it. Um, now, see that brace rod there curved? That's to make room for the pillow when we inflate it. But why do we have to have the brace rod? Well, that's going to be opening panel. When you inflate the pillow, it pulls in. So the triangle goes like that. huh? So all the triangles would be curved sides. But when the pillow next to the door gets inflated, pulls it out straight. But at the opening, we're going to have a vent. It would pull it. Uh, yeah. So we have to have a brace rod there. Learned that the hard way, you betcha. Oh boy, are these photogenic. Mm -mm. Oh, I gotta go back there a minute. That's a mulberry tree in the background. We got 600 pounds of mulberries off that tree in one year. Mm -mm. Okay, so we're growing up. There's the white snail there in the background. And then we carried it over we got out of reach of the hoses and stuff. 15 people. And we put it in place. And there it is getting built. Not inflated yet. Those on the left back there are cold frames for starting plants in the fall. In the spring, rather. Fall. And with freak snowstorm in the middle of April, yuck. Everybody says, aren't you afraid it's going to fall down? You should go out and check it. It doesn't have structural integrity yet. I didn't dare go look. <laughs> it was okay, though. And that's what we got. Still under construction. And 
begin to put the garden in there. It's really hot in there. Outside, it's still real cold. Rocking the berm wall. That turned out to take longer than building the whole structure. That's what it looked like. National Endowments for the Art. Are you watching? Inside, there's not a hot tub, folks. This is building, the, dragging these tanks in here. Here again, I did another rock thing so that the wind would scour the snow away. You learn about these things little by little, how to do it. Bending it to fit it through the door. <laughs> Putting the tanks in. These tanks are a different proportion. And we put fish in the tanks that had been in tanks 12 feet high. When we fed the fish in these tanks, they swam to the surface. They had remembered being 12 feet away. They go straight up in the air, not 12 feet. I'm not that, that far stretcher of the truth. But they would fly out and we'd find them on the floor. And it took them a while to get used to it. But tilapies are very durable. That's one of the reasons we use them. You can kick them around, put them back in the tank. They're all right. <laughs> Place beginning to work up here. Fig tree reviving. Garden beginning to grow. Curved path coming in there for the wheelchairs. Oh, yes. Access and all that stuff. Algae nice and black. Morning glories. Hmm. Yeah, you know what's between you and the snow in this thing is... 12 thousandths of an inch of plastic right down to the ground. This building weighs a half a ton, a square, or half a pound, God, a half a, I got up at four in the morning. A half a pound a square foot. That, folks, is light. This whole structure came in one trip in a Datsun pickup. If it was made of machine-made parts and not handmade parts so that all the parts were absolutely identical, the thing could have been assembled in one day by two people. You could live in something like this. And a book we wrote about it had, had some things about it in called The Village as Solar Ecology. Tony has a copy of it, I think, if you don't, in the library. I have on the cover a drawing that Paul's son, an out-of-sight architect, uh, s smoothed up for me. So I have a 100-foot diameter dome made this way. The, See, if you want to make the dome bigger, th this, dome, this dome is made with a 80 to 1 slenderness ratio of the tubes. Now that's about as far as you can go with one inch tubes. So if you, if you want to make a dome bigger using that, you can't use the tubes any longer. You have to make more triangles. So you just divide up the icosahedron faces into more triangles according to a pretty easy formula in spherical trig. Nothing to it with a calculator. Just push the button. Love that cosine button. And in my day, you had do cosines. I bet you don't even know what a cosine is. <laughs> but you know what the button does, right? That button is one of God's gifts to us, is that cosine button. There is a God. For a while, I didn't think there was a God because of cockapoos. <laughs> if there is a God that permits cockapoos, it's a God I don't want anything to do with. But Anyway, I think the cosine button makes up for the cockapoos. <laughs> anyway, you can add, it's getting later, see. Now the truth is coming out. Um, uh, may I point out the hub, which looks suspiciously like the cover of a camping pot, doesn't it? It is. We bought 90 of them at a closeout sale to cover up the messy hubs for the National Endowment of the Arts. Anyway. But a half a pound a square foot, I could build a dome now, and I have the calculations for it, 100 yards in diameter, size of a football field, that would weigh a half a pound a square foot on the ground, square foot on the ground. That is light. This dome withstood 130 miles an hour, too, and a yard of wet snowball-type snowman-making snow on it that didn't slide off because it snowed so slowly and so gently and no wind was blowing that it just accumulated on it. Big packy mess. Didn't come down. This building weighs 400 pounds. I think that's neat. I didn't design it. I had the idea of the pillows. It was built by about 40 people who liked each other enough to build it, who didn't get much pay for it. Why didn't somebody else build it? Well. No business is going to venture something like this. No school is going to teach courses that is not going to help you get a job in business. So you don't learn this kind of thing in school. 
Our society fortunately has a way of getting this kind of work done. It's a formal system. We just don't think it is at first. It's called grants. We got grants to do this. Grants are thin these days. New Alchemy had a budget of half a million bucks a year. United, uh, National Science Foundation, whatever, with Reaganomics a little thin. Rockefellers gave us some money for this. The nasty Rockefeller end of the family. Great, they built one of our other greenhouses for us too. Dirty money is the best kind of money. Arco gave us money. Yeah, that Arco. Um, that's good, for as far as we're concerned. The thing is that this kind of work really has to be done. Because it's just now coming in. I mean, we're, we're now coming to a, a place where this kind of work is actually needed. But 10 years ago, when we started this, 69, actually, we started this kind of work. The, the impetus for it started in 69. No, I mean, in 69, people didn't know about shortages. There hadn't been a fuel crisis. Gasoline was still 39 cents a gallon. Cars, you could buy a brand new Volkswagen for 1995. Yeah. 2195. Um, but you could see if you operate on principle, you knew it was going to come time someone was going to need this stuff. Let's give it a try. It's like climbing a mountain or something. Let's try it. Let's give it a whack. Let's see if you can do this. There's adventure in this. It's fun. It's a lot of bad work, working at midnight when you'd rather be at the picture show and so forth, but it's also really getting together with nice people, doing something that feels good to do, and you don't know whether really it's going to work or not because there's nobody to ask. There are no experts to consult. You're the expert. Nobody's going to license you. I give the licenses in this. Because <laughs> I know I happen to know more about pillow technology than anybody right now. Then Dave Sharuti comes along, the inventor of the heat mirror, and says, why don't you make the interior layer heat mirror? Ah. Indeed, next time. And why don't you make the outermost layer cloud gel? Uh-huh. Then we have a building that acts like your skin acts, that it, it lets things in or it doesn't let things in. Light, heat, moisture, wind. And this thing has openings in it that open and shut, not automatically, not yet. They could be done automatically even now. I've done a lot of powering of things like this with photovoltaic panels and use the motors that operate six-way power seats because they operate on 12 volts and they're cheap in junkyards to operate things like this to get it going. It's not very elegant, but it'll be elegant later. This will do right now for elegance. The Tevzel also happens to be pretty good at re rejecting long-wave IR. It's not as good as glass, but it's okay. It's within 25% as being as good as glass. That's close for this kind of thing. What we're getting towards, folks, is transparent insulation. But as the philosophy behind this is interesting, we're give, beginning to make architecture that isn't an expression of my artistry. I am making withinnesses. So I'm saying uh, my definition of architecture is a withinness within which I control the weather and anything else I care to control. This building has 1% point, excuse me, 0.1% infiltration in the winter with a 25 mile an hour wind outside. That's tight. The rubber, rubber gaskets on the openings. It means we can really control it. I said, let's put all window screens on there. We can control the bugs. Liz says, uh-uh. Nature will control the bugs if given half the chance in the right radiation mix of north light, which the other greenhouses don't let in with their shielded north sides. But the color in the north light does make a difference to the plants. And it makes a special difference to the bugs. So we had a big infestation breakout in there of spider mites. In two days, we had thousands of ladybugs flew in there and wiped them. We have lizards living in there, and there aren't any lizards in Massachusetts, but there are in that dome. How about that? Got snakes in there, frogs. That's what that is in the middle is a frog pond. You know what frogs eat? They eat the bugs, the bad guys. The dome does not leak. There's a tilapia. They taste great. They got a lot of bones in them. I hate bones. Anyway, the place got to be pretty aesthetic in there. The Teflon is self-washing, too. Nothing sticks to it. Um, 
It doesn't smell. It doesn't exude anything nasty. Nothing exudes out of it. It's utterly inert. Um, the reason it looks milky <clears throat> is because this is battery separator TEF cell and it was not made to be transparent. But it is actually more transparent than glass. Much more transparent. You can also get a great cut from the edge of it, by the way. You could cut somebody's throat with it. It sounds like sheet metal. <laughs> and I'm talking, trying to talk DuPont into making TEF cell that stretches. This doesn't stretch very much. All I have to do is turn a few knobs and they can put a little stretch in it, in the plant. But you've got to buy 5,000 pounds of it at 28 bucks a pound. That'd make a lot of domes. You don't necessarily have to make domes. This is more true to the way it really looks in color. I think that's pretty nice. I dig it. It is talking my language. Fun to do. Not real great outside. But ego-wise, I use the example like when you buy a Mercedes, you don't say, hey, I'm going to buy a Mercedes because I just love the way its windshield glass is. You don't think about the windshield in any car. Whether it's a Vega or a Mercedes doesn't make any difference because the windshield's just there. After you get used to this dome a little while, it's just there. You don't think about it as a thing. People say, well, what if they were all like that? It would be all domes all over. It would be so boring. You don't think LA is boring with all these tacky buildings around? It's a boring city. You go down Sepulveda Boulevard, that's enlightening. So, but what goes on inside it is another matter. We can concentrate on what goes on inside it. I'm not saying you necessarily have to have a dome. It is conceivable to make an enormous dome with still the slim slender.